How are you, Mr. Freed? Yeah, I have both names down, Stephen and Jason, and I am fine, thank you. Good. And I'm ready to talk with you about uh, my old buddy Stanley Kubrick. So many answers we may never know. Too many questions, get on with the show. No time for the chorus, only this bus. It's good to you. Open the podcast doors, Hal. It's Kubrick's Universe. The Stanley Kubrick Podcast. Hello, everybody. We are back with another episode of Kubrick's Universe, and we are very proud to present to you a most fantastic guest. We spoke to this wonderful guy in late 2018, when he was just 90 years young. He was one of the earliest collaborators of Stanley Kubrick, dating back to the early 1950s. His name, Gerald Freed. A native New Yorker and preternaturally gifted musician and composer, Freed has scored roughly 300 films and television shows in a career spanning over 70 years. His movie scores include such varied titles as Roger Corman's Machine Gun Kelly, Jack Nicholson's first feature film The Cry Baby Killer, The Killing of Sister George, Too Late the Hero, and The Grissom Gang, all three for director Robert Aldrich. His TV credits include some of the most popular shows being produced in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, including M Squad, Wagon Train, Gunsmoke, Gilligan's Island, The Man from Uncle, Mission Impossible, Policewoman, Lost in Space, and Star Trek. At the 1976 Academy Awards, Gerald was nominated for an Oscar for Best Music with an original dramatic score for the feature length documentary Birds Do It, Bees Do It. He was up against some legendary composers with many memorable scores. Jerry Goldsmith's work for The Wind and the Lion, Jack Nietzsche's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and the soundtrack for Bite the Bullet by former Kubrick collaborator Alex North. However, the winner that year was, of course, John Williams for one of the most instantly memorable movie scores of all time, Jaws. Suffice it to say, Gerald was in outstanding company that night. He also won a TV Emmy for his work with Quincy Jones on the essential landmark miniseries, Roots, from 1977. Having composed the scores for five of Stanley Kubrick's earliest films, Freed ranks as one of the most frequent collaborators in Stanley's filmography. He was also the final person for whom a Kubrick film was scored by a single composer. Freed and Kubrick first worked together as a composer-director partnership on the short film Day of the Fight back in 1951, followed by four feature films, Fear and Desire, Killer's Kiss, The Killing, and Paths of Glory. This installment is part one of our interview with Gerald. You're gonna hear him discuss the early years in New York when young and determined Gerald and Stanley were both just starting out, eager to carve their names into the film business of the mid 20th century. It's a real honor to have you speaking with us, Gerald. Thanks so much for joining us. How are you doing? Fine, and uh, I congratulate you on getting all the statistics correct. (laughs) Thank you. Off to a off to a, a, a decent start and in an auspicious beginning, shall we say? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, so obviously you and Stanley were both born in the Bronx and within a few months of each other. But when did you two first come in contact with each other? We were brought together by Alexander Singer, who, who has a, a good uh, background of winning awards as a director. He was interested in movies, and Stanley, as a Look Magazine photographer, became interested in movies, I think primarily because of Alex's passion for movies. And uh, 
uh, that's also true of me. And perhaps even, do you know the name Paul Mazursky, the director? Writer? Oh, of course, of course. He was part of that Greenwich Village bunch of uh, bright people. And Alex Mayer brought him into the uh, movie world, or at least got us interested in it. Hmm. Anyway, uh, Stanley asked me uh, to do the music for his first movie, The Short Day of the Fight, as you probably know. And With... then Stanley and I became friends. Um, uh, uh, besides, in addition to that, in fact, Stanley actually babysat for my firstborn at one time. Oh, you you got to be kidding me. Tell us no, about that. Uh, what I think what Stanley uh, was interested in me as a friend, I, I was a, a, a musician compared to those smart Greenwich Village intellectuals. I wasn't very educated. But <laughs> what I think he liked in me was the fact that I combined a professional career with being sort of what he would call, and what did call, a regular person. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, my credentials in that capacity were dramatized by me having a child at the age of 22. My gosh. Wow. An artist, somebody in music who actually is a family man. Mm. In addition to that, he found out that I was in a club called the Barracudas in the Bronx, and we had a softball team, and he wanted very much to play a game of softball, like, um, to use his phrase, like a regular guy. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. got him a game with the Barracudas. We put him in right field, and he did okay. He made a couple of catches. But I think the, the point of the story is was that for all his brilliance, and, and it's hard for him to be with regular people who are so much smarter and more sensitive, more introspective than we were, but he wanted to be a regular person, and he felt he accomplished that by playing softball with the Barracudas. <laughs> That's great. And you say he played right, huh? He played right field? Played right field, yeah. And he made his catches. No errors. Um, well, uh, <laughs> I I, he, he caught two and dropped one. Okay. That's not that bad. No, you know the saying, two out of three. Well, in baseball, that still means he was shall we say, catching 666, which is a high average. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Your so, position of, uh, of values is very flattering and very gracious of you. Oh, you're too kind. I mean, we, uh, we, we, we really appreciate um, obviously getting this, this grand opportunity just to chat with you. And we just like having a conversation um, more than conducting any kind of proper interview because, you know, we're regular guys ourselves. You know, we, we work jobs and uh, or have kids. And we've all also had this uh, kind of lifelong uh, abiding curiosity and uh, respect for Stanley um, that we each came to on our own uh, when we hooked up as friends and decided to... Uh, put this show together really for um, the benefit of, you know, the, for future generations, I could say, for people getting uh, a chance to hear directly from those who got to work with him, who knew him, and in your case, you know, who were also his friends. And so yeah. we, we consider it a real honor. And uh, but more than anything, you know, we we like to have fun. We take it seriously, but we like to have fun. That's so. Nation. Thanks. I mean, I hope I hope I was able to explain that. Okay. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in 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 that you know sort of uh, line of inquiry, I, you know about fun. Uh, I'm going to ask a question that that James uh, Marinaccio, our good friend and one of our chief researchers, he's he's proposed this question about you know Stanley apparently loved to play hooky and he missed a lot of school. And we're wondering if uh, you were spending any of that time with him. And if not, do you know what he was up to when he was a kid playing hooky? I would like to say yes. That adds to the story. But the truth is we didn't meet till after high school. I see. Okay. But I'll should... be happy to lie for this interview. <laughs> <laughs> well. Hey, and there's James now. Oh, Hi. hello. Hello, James. Hi, Madero. Yes. Hi. Oh, nice to meet you. Yeah. Oh, there's uh, one thing. Uh, while we were talking about uh, 
in babysitting. Uh, I'd like to add one uh, uh, corollary to that story. Do you remember the movie The Killing, the, uh, the name of the jockey who was shot, whose horse was shot in The Killing? Uh, do I remember the character's name or the actor's name? The character's name. Uh. The actor, I believe, was Tim Carey, but the character's name was the name of my son, Daniel Freed. Oh, wow. Kubrick was reason for a name, he thought, uh, just, just for the heck of it, having met Daniel at the age of two, he wow. named Jockey Daniel Freed. Just, just a, a fun corollary to the story. That's so cool. I, I should have, you know, more wisely made a little uh, leap of faith there and connected the dots. <laughs> that's that's wow, that's cool. But that's not unlike stuff that Stanley was uh, doing, using his friends and and family, particularly uh, in various uh, roles on the on the films that he made and sure, all stages. Ruth, Ruth Sabatka comes to mind. Tell tell us about uh, your memories of of them together, if you can. Uh, yes, they seemed well suited. Um, I knew Stanley's first wife, Toba, mm -hmm. and um, Stanley, for all his uh, discomfort with being regular and wishes to be considered a regular guy, um, nevertheless managed to marry the prettiest girl in high school, Toba. <laughs> yeah. That sort of taught us something that Stanley had something going for him. Right, right. He had that charisma. Apparently, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we, we we picked it up after a while. <laughs> but, you know, we were under pressure to be regular people. And uh, Stanley was not regular, even though uh, for very good reason. And uh, mm -hmm. his so-called irregularity certainly paid off in a magnificent career. Well, it seems to be... The... Anyway, he, yeah, uh, go on. Uh, seemed to be quite suitably married, and uh, she was kind of a star. She was both a dancer and the, a set and costume designer for, I believe it was City Center when George Balanchine was there. Mm -hmm. And they seemed perfectly mated, you know, in, in terms of personality and accomplishment, and, and physically they were both kind of good-looking. Mm. Well, the, and she was, uh, you know, apparently the young sophisticat and uh, was uh, integral in uh, bringing Stanley to the, the Greenwich Village scene and introducing him to a lot of the, the early beat poets and uh, such and people involved in the art scene at that time, at least according to, uh, you know, what we know from speaking with Vincent Labruto, who wrote, you know, arguably the definitive biography on Stanley and... Uh, so we were just curious about what uh, interactions you had, like what, what your memories were of uh, your time just hanging out with uh, Stanley and Ruth. But it sounds to me like you, you say they were happy. Seems to be quite happy. And when I was in uh, Germany scoring Paths of Glory, I had dinner with both of them just about every night. Well, hmm. very, Stanley, for all his brilliance, was a good friend and kind of a, a nice guy to use the Bronx vernacular. Yeah, a nice guy, exactly. Well, speaking of the Bronx... Um, well, there's other things, too, you know. Um, uh, he was kind of compulsive about uh, his work and control, but then again, that's required of a producer-director. Sure, of course. You know, um, having that singular, you know, vision, so to speak, but also being malleable. I, th I think that comes from, you know, being a, a Northeasterner, if I may, but I, I don't want to be presumptuous. And now, you know, I just wanted to touch upon the Bronx and see if James is in on the call because uh, James Marinaccio, our good friend and researcher, he's uh, born and raised in the Bronx as well. And I know he had a question for you about uh, uh, your time in the neighborhood. Are you there, James? I'm here, uh, yeah. Yeah, what neighborhood are you from in the Bronx? Oh, I moved around, but I grew up first around the Gun Hill Road, Pelham Parkway area. Yeah, I was up there at Kingsridge Road. Okay. 
Oh. You were more on the, like, over near Jerome and on the west side a little bit more, in the Grand Concourse, where... Yes. Oh, right. you were over were near Evander Childs High School, then. Oh, my goodness. That's where I went. I went to Evander Childs. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Did you happen to live in one of those uh, garment workers' big buildings, like what they used to call the Coops or the Amalgamated Building? No, but a lot of my friends did. I lived in little, uh, little like, two-family houses. We moved around, like, like Kubrick. He moved. Uh, he moved a lot he, in the Bronx, and then when he went to Manhattan, I put together a little film recently, put it on YouTube, because me and Jason, uh, at different times, took video of the addresses that we got from the Vincent Labruto biography, and we put we took some video of the, of the addresses and put it together, and he moved, he moved so much. Yeah. One time he moved two doors down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't know him in the Bronx days, even though okay. we're both from the Bronx. Oh, okay, that's interesting. So yeah. you spent more time when he was down in Manhattan. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. He, yeah. See, I didn't realize that. Yeah, he and Toba had a little apartment up on what's it, Fourth Street or Sixth Street or one of the Greenwich Village side yeah, streets. Sixteenth or at one time or tenth at another yeah. time. Yeah, somewhere around there. Well, you mentioned about, uh, you know, Stanley just wanting to be like a regular guy. And, um, you know, we know that he was very close with his family. And uh, I'm just wondering if you remember uh, ever meeting Stanley's parents and his sister, Barbara Mary. Yes. What, what, are, your, what are your memories of them? Uh, Stanley's parents uh, were they. My parents and most of the people I knew in the Bronx were, we were first generation. Our parents were all born in the old country. Mm -hmm. Stanley's parents may have been, I don't even know, but they did not look like that. They were trim and upright and handsome, and his mother was quite attractive. Mm -hmm. And that's my impression of them. And he was a doctor, which mm -hmm. isn't unusual for you know, first or second generation uh, Eastern Europeans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, uh, they they had kind of a a, a, a style which uh, my parents and people I knew did not have, and I'm not sure how that affected him, uh, but it obviously did. But I uh, I didn't know them well enough to know anything of their dynamics except uh, they were kind of good looking and comfortable with the world. Mm. That's interesting. That's a that's a very unique take on it is comfortable with the world i'm going to remember that i yeah, like maybe that maybe only in uh, comparison to my own parents and the parents <laughs> of the other people i grew up yeah with. we all have that frame of reference of uh, seeing yeah. life initially through the eyes of our own parents that's well said and i remember his sister being uh, not quite comfortable in her own skin oh interesting do you know uh, you know about her do you have some research about her about Barbara Mary, we know uh, too much. I, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, somewhat, but not too much uh, to be as to be prying. Uh, I do know that she lived a good chunk of her adult life here in New Jersey. Right, yeah, her, her son, actually, her son, Kubrick's nephew, at a time when we had a we had a Kubrick way before social media, we had a a Kubrick group on uh, alt movies Kubrick, and her her son. Robert Croner. I'm pretty sure that was her son. He used to be on that group. He talked a little bit about her, but I don't really remember what he was saying. Though. Yeah. Okay. I can't help you much in that area either. Yeah. So you um, you did the music for Day of the Fight. Yes, I did. Okay. He lived what he lived in an apartment, and the church used in that in that short was right across the street. Yes, it was. And I remember taking the photograph of the apartment, and I wasn't aware of that. And I turned around, and I said, oh, my goodness, that's the church. Now, through the quiet morning streets of New York, the two boys walk to morning mass. It's important for Walter to get Holy Communion in case something should go wrong tonight.
And it's probably, I don't know if, if you're aware, but it, I, I suspect maybe the same serendipity happened with him, and he just used it because it was across the street from where he lived. That's a pretty good reason right there, you know, <laughs> to go past that reason. It's just available and did the job that uh, he wanted us to do. Well, that, I mean, that's nothing if uh, to not show how resourceful he was, as we already know. I mean, he, he was always very wisely culling his resources from whichever uh, angle seemed to make the most sense. And I, I can attest to what James is saying. I mean, the church is like, it's not on an opposite corner, but it's catty corner, so to speak. It's just diagonally across the street from that apartment he was living in. And maybe, I don't know, 40 yards away, would you say, James? 50 yeah. yards away? It's yeah. like nothing. It's right there. And he must have just looked at his window and said, oh, I need a location there. You know. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of that apartment, uh, I forgot the name of his dog, but I knew Stanley had a dog he loved very dearly. Do you know the name of that dog? Gosh, I don't. Oh, wow, no. We certainly know he was an animal lover. Yeah. All right, because we all know about when he moved to England to the English countryside, and he had the you know the homes, the estates with all with all the the land around it. That he he had many dogs and cats, and there are yeah. some photographs of it. But I didn't even think of that if he had pets in New York. So that's really cool to hear. He had one dog, a small dog, with an ordinary name like Spot or something like that. <laughs> Rover. Howard. <laughs> Yeah, on that in that category, and he showered a lot of affection on that little fellow. Well, that makes sense. I mean, what pictures we do have of him with dogs and cats, um, as animal people ourselves, it's clear that you know you're looking at someone who, uh, for whom it was effortless to just dote affection upon those animals. It came very naturally to him, and it was something he wanted to uh, to do. It was just. Uh, uh, inherent in his personality, and I think that speaks volumes of any man who, you know, has that kind of compassion for the little creatures in the world, so to speak. Gerald, do do you remember that what the dog looked like? I remember black and white, small. Uh, is it the is it the one that was in Day of the Fight? Because. Uh, the, the two the two brothers, the twins, they didn't have a dog in real life, but I believe that Stanley provided them a, do- a, oh, a, a, a yeah. dog just to show a bit of like, compassion with the boxer. Uh, so I wonder if that was his dog that he used in the film then, because it, it, it did supply Yeah, it. I think so. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I bet you're onto something there, Stephen. At Walter's three-room apartment where he lives with his aunt... Vince is serving him breakfast. He's a lawyer and Walter's manager. Vince lives in New Jersey, but in the slow hours before the fight, he's staying with his brother. Now they live as they used to years ago, the two boys and Walter's dog. Well, I want to skip ahead because uh, your son Joshua mentioned something about this, and I, I'm not familiar with this, so I'm just going to phrase the question as, uh, as, as best as I have it presented to me. Um, but Stephen was wondering, it has to do something about a tennis court reservation. Does this sound <laughs> <laughs> okay? Uh, well, I'm, in the, I'm in the dark here. Help me out, sir. Okay, yeah, that's that, uh, so we... Uh, we played tennis both in Central Park and in the Riverside Drive courts. And uh, there was once in, we were waiting for a Central Park court. And uh, I'll tie this story with something else that happened uh, on a production meeting of The Killing. But first, I'll finish the tennis story. And Stanley saw some people hanging around there. Of, of We were in line waiting for a court. And... Uh, he said, we better move up fast because those two people are over there, they look like they want the court, and I don't want to be in a position where you know, we'll, they come and cut in front of us and get the court and we can't play tennis and they have to go home. And I said, Stanley, um, 
I don't know, I didn't know if I understood the word paranoia at that time. We were still in 21, 22 years old. Mm-hmm. But I said, so please, I, just, I can't beat yourself like that. Forget it. Just relax. <laughs> and exactly what he predicted did happen. Mm. Uh, they did cut in front of us. And before we could interrupt, they got the court and Stanley and I went home without playing tennis oh. that day. Oh, man. Yeah, I want to tie that in with was on the set of the killing, there was a, a pre-production meeting. Uh, I don't know the circumstances, but a lot of the people who were working on the picture were there. And Stanley looked around, and he said, not prompted but by me, I don't know what prompted him, he said, he pointed somebody and said, he is going to fuck up. He's not going to finish the picture. <laughs> and he looked at somebody else and said, he's going to finish the picture, but uh, he's so self-involved, he's not going to do a good job. <laughs> and once again, I looked at Sam and he said, come on, man, don't give me this paranoia shit. And he's over the, like I said, I didn't know the words. And, well, maybe right. by the age of 22, I did. And of course, that's exactly what happened. Wow. <laughs> and uh, that's perhaps one of the reasons he was such a master movie maker. Of, he anticipated problems. He, he read yes. his magnificently yeah yeah i get that i get exactly what you're saying there and how you frame it that's brilliant let me ask you gerald um uh just for our listeners curiosity i'm wondering why it is that you came uh to score the first five kubrick films and none thereafter (laughs) thank you for asking uh that's because i think kubrick produced and directed his pictures like a master chef. He wanted to control all the ingredients. So much so like in Passive Glory, I was told he actually heard, auditioned all the machine gun shots in the battle field, heard <laughs> each one individually. That's hundreds of sound effects. Oh yeah. It's that important to him and that's maybe one of the reasons he's Stanley Kubrick, you know, one mm-hmm. of the most honored uh, directors of all time. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, he couldn't really put the music into the master chef mix because you really can't get the feel of the music till you, you hear the orchestra. Mm. And by that, uh, the recordings, the musicians were so expensive that he was not in a position to redo it if he didn't like it. Mm-hmm. I think um, it was much safer for him to hear pre-recorded music. Also, it was an opportunity to show how clever he is and the you know, the marvelous use of that pre-recorded <laughs> music, you know, the Zarathustra, the Blue Danube. Mm-hmm. That was kind of brilliant. Uh, but I think in addition to that, he knew it and could deal with it and put it into uh, the ingredients as a master chef. And whereas with the uh, music hasn't heard yet, he could not do that. And this may be uh, an alibi for me, like <laughs> maybe two more reasons. Um, uh, Neither of one which I believe are true, but I like telling this. I was so good, I could not be replaced by a living composer. <laughs> or, or I was so bad that he lost faith in living composers. Like oh, said, my gosh. Neither one is true, but I like telling that. Bo- and both are hilarious. <laughs> They're, those are really funny, like, personal takes that no one else but you has. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Also, perhaps one of the reasons that Passive Glory was primarily an all-percussion score was because Stanley, in his high school orchestra, was a drummer. Well, we're going to get to that. Of course I do. I'm a lifelong drummer myself, Gerald. And I have to ask you, yeah, but that aside, I have to know, um, because as we know, um, you know, uh, your primary instrument was the oboe and Stanley's was the drums. So did you did you guys ever play together? I think we once started fooling around. He had some Latin instruments, so of uh, oboe and especially English horn, which is you know is a big brother of the oboe. Mm-hmm. Sounds good on Latino music. So I play some things, and he improvised something on a, a guiro or maracas or one of those uh, Latino instruments. Yeah, we actually did once. As as I understand it, I mean, uh, Stanley was not just like an ordinary timekeeping drummer. That he actually had the feel, and he could uh, he could swing. 
And I, I would give anything to be able to hear a recording of Stanley playing drums, even just like a 30 or 60 second soundbite. But uh, so far, it's been a dead end. Uh, promise me, if, if you won't quote me on this or anything, I like that story better than what I know of him. He played percussion with the high school symphony orchestra. Mm -hmm. you know, traps, timpani, cymbals like that. I do not know anything about Stanley on sit-down drums, but I like the story. So uh, forget about the truth, if you would, and I'll go with your story that I jammed with him. <laughs> <laughs> Except for those your few Latino instrument things. Well, that's, that's still a jam. I've been in many situations where, you know, there isn't a, a proper drum kit. And, you know, the, the, in the 90s, there were kids uh, who played what they call, you know, drum circles. And people show up at a park with different percussion instruments, and there's some guitars floating about, and people, uh, yeah, you know, do do a whole like uh, rhythmic combo. But uh, no, I have that's, seen we have seen a photo of Stanley's drum kit, uh, the one that he had in his uh, home at at, at Chittickbury. So we know that at least towards the end of his life, and yeah, and I'm pretty sure according to Vincent Labruto's book that. He played uh, in a jazz combo uh, for some time anyway, when he was either, you know, late in high school or in the early years right after. I'm going to have to revise my story to include myself in that. Uh, the truth is I never did jam with him with jazz, but he was, as you know, a chess fanatic and he played chess. Uh, when he was living in the village in Washington Square, and there were innumerable percussion groups scattered all around Washington Square. Of course. So it's possible that he played with one of those. And uh, I'd love to lie and say I joined in. In fact, in my next interview, I may have uh, talked myself into lying. No, that's okay. Since we I have a little more, little more time, uh, can I ask a follow-up question? Uh, this is very minor, about the percussion in Washington Square. Because the last time I was there, I vividly remember people improvising. They would take these like plastic containers and turn, empty them and turn them upside down and play the drums on them. And yeah. Do you remember people d doing things like that, or was it like a proper drum set? Oh no, most mostly uh, uh, home improvised instruments, right. especially oh. back in the seventies. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. I've seen some of those guys. I, I, I spoke with a guy once when I was traveling in Portland, Oregon. I saw a young guy who was playing those. They're like uh, five-gallon pickle barrels. Yeah, I believe. yeah. Yeah, they're used for like food uh, transportation and uh, for restaurants and such. And this guy had a whole elaborate setup, and he had some <laughs> pots and pans and a, a garbage can lid or two that he had pounded with a hammer to create a specific tone. And I, I, I was I was fascinated with, I mean, he was a real rhythmatist. You could have given him anything and he could have gotten some, some real great beats out of it for you. And I had a great conversation with him. And I remember, you know, he, him being in a very touristy area in downtown Portland, Oregon. And I, I asked him like, you know, how he did with this, what kind of money he made. And it was, it was ridiculous. He said that he traveled all over the country and would go to tourist spots and he made somewhere in the neighborhood. I'm not making this up like one hundred thousand dollars a year. Wow. <laughs> wow. And if you passed him on the street, you'd see, oh, there's a guy with plastic buckets and garbage can lids. What a bum. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he plays the drums. So, OK, right. <laughs> Am I allowed to interject? A story? Please, please do. OK, uh, I did. Some of the Gilligan's Island. In fact, I did it uh, off and on three years of Gilligan's Island. One of the sessions was where they had to uh, provide music so Ginger could sing, and they had no instruments there, so they had to make instruments out of shells and pots and pans and mm -hmm. empty logs and things like that. And I had to reproduce the sounds myself, you know, for the uh, soundtrack, sure. improvising instruments. Pretty much like what you were describing, old pots and pans and cans. And that was fun and uh, challenging, too. So I had my share of playing drunk instruments. <laughs> That's so cool. 
Well, it's also there, like you're doing a hybrid of musical scoring and Foley work, so to speak. Yes, exactly. <laughs> How cool. So, all right, let me uh, toggle back uh, just a bit to, uh, you know, some of your uh, early days in uh, in the Bronx. And, you know, we have to assume that none of you guys had a car back then. So how did you, uh, as you Bronxites would say, uh, get into the city? You know, uh, how did you get to downtown Manhattan? Uh, were, the, were you primarily taking buses or, or the subway, like no. the four line, the D? The, the, the D, which is in, was called the IND, just uh, independent, and the uh, IRT. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, and uh, did you know Stanley did a story for Look Magazine about a band traveling home late on the subway? I think so. I have seen. Yeah. Have oh, we seen yeah. it? That was my band. I was in that picture. Oh, my gosh. We have to look that up again. I yeah, remember I mean, the pictures in the lower, where people are kissing and being passionate or something. I don't remember people playing music. It's probably the same, same set. Uh, I think he's saying they were just we traveling were, home. We weren't playing. We were sleeping. He, he wanted us falling asleep. Oh, uh, so yeah, I think I've seen that, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> So, and you must have taken the Third Avenue L, obviously, the elevated train. Yep. Yep. So, at, we know that Stanley also loved to go to Yankee games at Yankee Stadium. Did you guys, I have to ask, did you ever go to the legendary polo grounds ever to see the New York Giants? Actually, even though I lived in the Bronx, I was a, a National League fan and a Giant fan. I respect so, yes, that. I went to the polo grounds. I actually went to Ebbets Field once, wow. all the way in Brooklyn. Wow. That's super cool. <laughs> yeah. Do you recall what year you were at Ebbets Field? It had, let's see, I was in 1940s. Okay. Some 40s and 50s. I never got this. Uh, th those were gone by the time I came around, but I do remember the old Yankee Stadium. And um, even before it was refurbished in 1976, and when they, when you would sit at the game and they would they had these big steel columns. If you had a bad seat, you had a column in front of your face. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember I think, when I was a little kid, I remember the Third Avenue L, and it was uh, decommissioned, and they were tearing it down. Oh, right, right. Uh, so my brother had a girlfriend who lived on the fifth floor across from Yankee Stadium, so we got to watch the games free. Oh, man, that's great. Like the guys she was a very popular girl. <laughs> <laughs> In what way? <laughs> she was also pretty, as well as having a free view. Anyway, yeah. I didn't want to hear about my brother's girlfriends, I assume, but... You know, uh, James, in the uh, when they refurbished the stadium, and I think it was completed in 76... That was the year I first went to the stadium. I would have been six years old. And uh, I remember my dad telling me that the uh, the black box out in center field, what they called the batter's eye, that w my dad was born in 47. And he said that when they were kids, you could show up uh, at the gate back behind the batter's eye, the black box, show up on game day uh, and buy a ticket for 25 cents. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Wow. I I went. I had an opportunity once to be inside the stadium and walk around when there was no game. That's a long story, but I, they used to have these these monuments to players, and they were in the field of play. They were yep. three of them, and I remember going up to them and fans couldn't do that, but I had this privilege one day, and I was able to do that. That was really cool. And well, I, what, when they were re, when they were tearing it down in seventy partially to not they didn't completely tear they were fixing some of the wall in 76 it was cordoned off because it was a construction site and i remember i i waited and I, when they weren't looking and i ran in real quick and i took a rock and i still have it to this day <laughs> that's actually oh pretty my. cool yeah i just can i just interject a question that popped into my head and please so you you, you work that we've said you worked on kubrick's first five films but he made, in, in between 51 and 57, he did other film work. He did The Seafarers, 
and he did uh, some television work for Young Lincoln. And there are rumors about other things he may have done. Do, uh, do you know of any time Stan is like, oh, I got to be away for a few weeks because yeah. I'm going to make a little money doing such and such? He did something, I think, for RKO Pathé called The Flying Pastor. Flying Padre, right? The Flying Padre, yeah. We have that's on, uh, that's on the internet now. It's nine minutes long. Oh, for God's sakes. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's no Kubrick stone left unturned, it seems. Uh, or, you know, at least people are, st- are still trying. What's, yeah. the, what's the one, James, that you pointed out or Stephen brought up that's uh, mentioned in the World, of Youth. the World Assembly of Youth, yeah. which may have been like his earliest contribution? Uh, so, uh, Felipe says he didn't. He doesn't think he actually did it. It, was, it, it never got made. Ah. Uh. Was this before Day of the Fight? It was. Wait, they, these all these things we're mentioning were kind of in between. I think they oh. were. It may have been after Day of the Fight, but before the but before the killing. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, you guys, uh, as we know, you know, Stanley loved to go to the movies at the RKO Fordham and the Lowy's Paradise Theater. Right. And, uh, you know, there are also many long forgotten one off theaters in and around that area where you guys lived, Um, because, of course, you know, multiplexes, as they're now called, or multiple screen theaters didn't really come into existence until the late 70s. Do you have uh, memories of uh, going to see movies with Stanley or any particular movie memories of your own? Share share them with us, please. We went uh, to a lot of movies uh, and. uh, Stanley, uh, there were some bad movies, and I sort of asked him, well, why do you want to see these? He says, you could learn, you could learn even better from bad movies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, we went, in fact, uh, let's see, in, in Germany, we we went maybe three or four t- nights a week to a movie. And in New York, uh, we did a lot, too, Yeah. And it was fun with him because his conversations after, you know, he would say, yeah, did you see that match? And you see how they uh, use that fence there to blend in with this guy's necktie in a slow dissolve. You know, things that I never noticed, but uh, mm. Stanley, of course, did. That's really cool. Um, yeah. And I, I do recall, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but some... Someone said that 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 Stanley had said uh, that he absorbed all manner of film, good and bad, because they, particularly as you pointed out, with him learning from bad films, that there there was apparently one afternoon he came out of a theater and said, "Well, I, if I could get my hands on some equipment, I know I can't possibly make a worse film than what we just saw." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he did learn. I think that's a great story. It's so telling about him. Yeah. So I, I just want to ask on that uh, topic, it's just a personal question, because I'm, I'm a fan of uh, the late Japanese director, the legendary Akira Kurosawa, and as I understand it, um, his film Rashomon, um, which was one of the original unreliable narrator uh, type of films, um, Stanley saw that uh, you, uh, in in New York when it first premiered in America. You don't know if you remember seeing that with him, do you? Just curious. No, I don't remember, but it certainly is possible that we did. In fact, that for a few months it was almost probable, so, but mm. I really can't say for sure. Yeah. Do you remember roughly how many times you guys would go to the movies during that time? 20, 30 times, lots of movies. Sure. And how much was a ticket then, Gerald? I think it, they started at something like 25 cents. <laughs> <laughs> that so, sounds reasonable. I'm, I'm not sure. But uh, as a poor student, it certainly was within my budget. Mm-hmm. So, in, you know, all those early formative years watching movies um, and in the early days of your film work, uh, you must have had your ears and eyes trained 
to an understanding of, of trying to grasp how music in film worked. So my question is, were there any particular films that you saw in the late 40s and early 50s that really made an impact on you as a composer for film? Oh, for sure. Uh, Sergei Prokofiev's score for Alexander Nevsky is the, the, the dominant influence in my film scoring life. Mm-hmm. Bernard Herrmann was another major. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of the Malcolm Arnold scores uh, and, and among my contemporaries, Elmer Bernstein, who mm. succeeded by five years uh, into uh, the movie business. Of course. So were, were you... Uh... Alex Dorff is another major influence. Oh, of course. Of course, yeah. Um, I, I'm just wondering if uh, at, at that time were you playing in the little orchestra in new york city while all this was going on yes yes as a matter of fact in order to do the killing i had to uh, quit the orchestra a week before the spring the christmas break and um, i wrote tom sherman the conductor saying uh tom forgive me i'm violating my contract and i will pay whatever penalty i'm supposed to pay <laughs> this is an opportunity to write and conduct a score in Hollywood. I may never get this one again, and I'm b- b- violating my contract. Forgive me, and like I said, I will do whatever I can legally and uh, you know, morally to, to to compensate for this breach of contract. And, of course, he wrote back and says, go for it. And um, there weren't <laughs> there were enough overs around New York City um, uh, so uh, I wasn't uh, leaving them in the lurch. But yes, uh, I did the killing during the season of 55, something like that. 54, 54. 54, I'm thinking. Yeah, wow. That, yeah. That's so cool that it had a happy ending and uh, you were, you know, released uh, from your contract because otherwise, you know, the world wouldn't have gotten uh, all your great work. Yeah, I wasn't uh, going to take I wasn't going to take a chance of being released from the contract. I just mm-hmm. left. Right, right. That's, also, that's you asked that's uh, wise... how did I prepare and what influenced me. I have to tell you the story when Stanley first asked me to do the music for uh, Day of the Fight. Uh, I was an oboe major at Juilliard, and uh, I was did some jazz arranging, but that's all I did with you know pencil or pen and paper. So when he said, hey, you know, Jerry, I, you're the musician I know. Uh, do, you, do you know how to conduct and uh, compose and synchronize a movie score? I said, sure, Stanley. All <laughs> old players know how to do that. <laughs> but he meant it. He actually put money down on the, the RKO Fifth Avenue studio in New York. He meant it. Yeah. Uh, so I spent four or five months doing nothing but going to movies and learning what to do. And thinking I didn't know how to sync a soundtrack. Um, I didn't know about click tracks. So what I did was I uh, took a metronome that had both a click, 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 and a light blinking. I disconnected the click, click, and put the light blinker up on the podium. Blinking. Wow. And I conducted to, uh, to half of a blinking metronome. And I got to the score. And uh, That is extremely clever. Yeah, he Stanley loved it, that, uh, and I, I, I was a review just a few years ago. Somebody say uh, he restored the killing. Maybe it was one of you guys uh, who said, and there was Gerald Fried's music pound, 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 pounding me into the wall. <laughs> was that one of you fellows who wrote that? It was not me, sir. Although I would yeah be uh, honored to make such an apt description. Yeah, I was flattered by it, but he meant it as an insult. <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't have taken it as an insult at all. Yes. I mean, that's, that's the power of music, right? That's the effectiveness, pounding you into the wall like that. And again, I got to say, I think that's extremely clever and resourceful of you to, to do something like that. That is improvisation in its own right. I mean, on a technical level, here you are as a musician you've committed to this and you're teaching yourself how to uh, work along to a click track 
and you create this method by using a light bulb in in synchronicity with that that's that's something that i'm guessing stanley would have seen as very much in line with his own uh gumption when it came to okay how can i figure this out yeah. how do i think this work I, yeah. okay. I uh, have to tell you a story when i was speaking with stanley about the music for day of the fight i said to him well stanley in this scene what would you like the movie to do and he said the same thing i always ask from you and he Imitated a drum beat, which is his way of telling me driving music as much as possible. Hmm. I get so that. He, yeah. So uh, I, from his sort of encouraging, that's when I thought of that the main theme of the music for the killing, which is the dog fight between two and three. You know, the both of the rockers playing pum 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 pum, mm-hmm. and the brass are going. Bum, 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 bum. Mm-hmm, so that mm-hmm. book, five, two, and three, was the essence of the music, which is the most tense music I could think of. And we liked it. I got four more pictures with him from that. Uh, yeah, you did. Well, I mean, that, uh, uh, you know, brings to mind the, you know, the word, uh, you know, propulsion, that propulsiveness that is so clear in your scores that really, I think, is essential to Stanley's films. In terms of the the narrative, it really does. Your your scores really do help drive the story forward with that you know uh, you know brilliantly syncopated uh, rhythmic drive, for want of a better phrase. Well, that's the theory. <laughs> that's what <laughs> we get paid to do. Wow. So, did you come from a musical family, Gerald? Yes, my grandfather in the old country was court musician. To uh, what's his name? Uh, Zor Chernovsky, I think his name was one of the biggest land loaner, owners in the Ukraine, and he hired my grandfather to be the court musician, teach the other serfs how to play, and just provide music for him. Yes, I got, and uh, his one of his daughters was my piano teacher, and she uh, moved to Montreal and played piano for silent movies. No kidding. No wow, kidding. I, I, I have to share this with you. So I was fortunate enough to uh, have two great grandmothers, both of whom uh, were pianists. My father's mother's mother was a classically trained pianist and a music uh, major graduate from Smith College in Northampton, Mass. And she could not play without sheet music. My father's my father's father's mother was completely self-taught and she was the daughter of a piano teacher. However, my great grandmother, this one, we, we had Mapa and Garapa. Now Mapa was uh, the, the, the classically trained and Garapa uh, played in the silent movie houses in her day and she did it to just raise enough money to help feed her brothers and sisters. And her mom was a music, a, a piano teacher, and she would come into the parlor room after the students would leave thinking, you know, oh, the students, they're playing. And she didn't understand how her daughter, again, my great grandmother, was able to just listen from the other room and figure out by ear what she was hearing. And then she would go into the parlor room and sit down at the piano and play every lesson that her mother had just been showing her students. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, on, on my that, honor, that's true. Oh, yeah. Uh, I know people like that. To some extent, I could do that. So, now, your um, your grandmother's daughter, I guess your, your grandma was your... I, I'm sorry. My, let, my, let me get the context my, right. Your piano teacher in Montreal. Was my, was my aunt. My your mother. aunt. Yeah. So when did you first take piano lessons from her? At the age of eight. Eight. And had I you hated it. Yes, so did I. <laughs> now I yeah. love it. Right. Did you decide to become a musician, uh, you know, before sitting down at the keys? Or when was your come to music moment? <laughs> um, my come against music moment started when they made me take piano lessons. And 
I didn't like anybody to make me do anything. Yeah. And became probably the world's worst piano student in the Bronx, <laughs> just out of spite. <laughs> but the punchline to the story is, at the age of 12, uh, one of my brother's friends was a saxophone player. He didn't want to play anymore. So uh, he sold me the saxophone. Within six months, I was working. And at the age of 14, I was already making enough money to give myself a sense of independence. Wow. Which is a, a, a good demonstration of motivation uh, in pedagogy. The, I'm still a lousy pianist, even though I use the piano, of course, <laughs> as the instrument of reference. But give me something I wanted to do to play jazz saxophone. And like I said, at the age of 14, I was a working stiff. That's that's amazing. Uh, I, yeah, go on. Oh, I was just going to say, and being an oboist first, I went to music and art high school, and uh, I came in on piano, and uh, they they give you an orchestral instrument, and they gave me the oboe, for which I am eternally grateful. I love the instrument, and I still play in the Norwalk Symphony and in the Connecticut Symphonic Winds here. Oh, I have to come up and see you. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm not even half joking. I got to make a point of doing that. Um, okay. I would love to see play. I I was also fascinated with uh, woodwind, and the oboe has always had a a special place in my heart. I I wanted to play saxophone, but I was a, a I, I was slow to grow in size, and they told me my hands were too small, and I was uh, made to play the clarinet in the school band uh, for about three years, and I grew disinterested in that. But I still had a, an undying passion to uh, be involved with music, to have a relationship with music. And at, at some point um, prior to that, I, I had seen uh, a few performances of drumming, including uh, Buddy Rich on TV. And I, re I remember going to my parents and saying, I want drums, I want drums, I want drums. And I, apparently I wouldn't stop. And uh, they relented and got me a drum kit when I was about nine. I think for my ninth birthday, they got me, you know, like a snare drum with a, a little cymbal attached to it and uh, a kick drum, that kind of thing. And you played clarinet before then, did you say? I think it was around that same time. I was, like you, forced into piano lessons. And um, they saw that I wasn't particularly interested in certain school subjects. Um, but that I, I had a, a thing for the arts and writing, um, the humanities, if you will, and especially music. So they said, well, you know, stick him in in uh, the band. And uh, I said, oh, OK, well, I'm going to play saxophone if I have to be in the, the school band. And they said, no, you won't because your hands are too small. But uh, I did play clarinet. And for those three to four years, I think between like um, I want to say nine and age 13, uh, I did know how to read sheet music. I've long since lost the ability, but I, I do understand music theory comprehensively, um, thanks to also being from a musical family. And uh, my dad would, uh, my dad's a fantastic guitar player in his own right. And he just basically said, you know, here's how you figure out what song the key is in. These are your relative majors and minors. This is the natural progression. This is, you know, arpeggiating this is you know diminished augmented chords etc and uh i just kind of went from there but I, I i can't lie there's part of me that does wish that i could uh sheet read so <laughs> that that all said uh i just wanted to share that with you because um okay. i i uh i i basically live for music gerald it's it's my uh my oxygen if you will all right i like you for that reason uh, I like you for another reason, which is uh, your size. I was the third smallest kid in my high school. <laughs> I, uh, did you get your growth? Because I never got past 5'8". I'm 5'7", on a good day. Oh, good. That's why I like <laughs> you, yeah. You, you're, you're taller than me. You could probably still take me out with a, a one-two punch. <laughs> Uh, hey, I'm 90 years old. I'm down to five foot three and a half now. It's coming. I know. It's happening to me already. I, I just turned 48. All right. Hey, All right. Is, I'm enjoying this. 
Okay, that was part one, and we will be back with a future episode with Gerald in which he shares much more detail on the collaboration, process, and delivery of the scores to the five films that Gerald and Stanley worked on together. One further note, like Stanley Kubrick, Gerald Fried is another kid from the Bronx. He went on to have a fantastic career and an accomplished life as well. We at Kubrick's Universe are leading the charge to help get Gerald inducted into the Bronx Walk of Fame. So please, drop them an email to show your support of this great man and very worthy entrant to the fabulous Bronx Walk of Fame. You can support this cause by contacting Deputy Director of the Bronx Tourism Council, Sophia Thierfelder Griffol at sfrifoll at boedc dot org. You can send a snail mail to the Bronx Tourism Council as well. They're located at 851 Grand Concourse, Suite 123, Bronx, New York, USA, zip code 10451-2937, or even dropping a dime at area code 718-590-3518. Thanks to James Marinaccio and, of course, Joshua Freed for setting up this interview. Thanks also to Mark Lentz, James Marinaccio, and Stephen Rigg for such continually great research. Give us a shout on Facebook, either at the Stanley Kubrick Appreciation Society or Kubrick's Universe. And if you like what you hear, make sure you are subscribed to the show on your favorite podcatcher, and please rate and review us. I'm your host and humble narrator, Jason Furlong. Thanks for listening. I'm now going to turn it over to our favorite and frequently schmaltzy DJ, Stick Blightingale. Take it away, Stick. Hey, thanks, man. 724, top of the hour, 15 minutes to 5. Looks like we got us another cold front moving in, or perhaps a sweltering heat wave, depending on where you are in the world and what time of day you're listening to this. Sports and traffic coming up way after this show, because we don't really care. All right, that's good for that. And here's Stick's Bit. Stick's Bit. Huh. That sounds like a new device you wear around your ankle to check your foot health. Hey, thanks, man. 7.24, top of the hour, 15 minutes to 5. Looks like we got us another... Looks like we got us another water pipe noise happening. That's what it sounds like. Listen, those water pipes come, Stephen, I know it may... It may sound like defeat. It may look like defeat. It may even smell like defeat, but it's not defeat. It's Kubrick's universe. We just live in it. We have taken very thorough precautions in this podcast against broadcasting anything which might only be attributed to human error. These guys aren't scientists. They're making it up as they go along.